today's scripture reading is going to be from Isaiah 59, 14 through 21. <coughs> All the singing. <coughs> Great. Um, and it can be found on page 527 in the Bible in front of you, or it should also be on the screen behind me. Okay. So Isaiah 59, 14 through 21. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public squares, and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered what there was <clears throat> no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies. To the coastlands he will render repayment. For they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing stream, which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer shall come to Zion, and those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore. May God bless the reading of his word. That passage of scripture in Isaiah is filled with incredible promises for you and I. It reveals God's plan for how he is going to accomplish his purpose and his work. And he does that through his Holy Spirit in believers, in each generation and in every nation on the face of the earth. We're going to explore that passage in just a few moments. But we've been looking at um, Ephesians. We're almost done with the book of Ephesians and the study. And we're specifically focusing in on the armor of God. And so I want to read these verses again for us just from the, the passage that we're, we'll be expanding on from Ephesians chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to, to turn there or turn there on your, um, on your phone and um, make notes as you go along, especially about the Scripture. Because here's what happens in any time that we gather together. It is not so much what a preacher or a teacher may say that, that may be the thing that, that really resonates. But when you're following along and when you're asking the Lord to show you, to teach you, especially from his word, he will speak to you. He will reveal truths about himself, truths from his word. His Holy Spirit will, will take the things that are said and the things that are read and he will implant them into your heart. And you will draw closer to the Lord. You'll be challenged. Sometimes you'll be convicted. But it is a good, good thing because the Lord is speaking. The question really is, are we willing to listen? Let's look at his word. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit and with all prayer and supplication. Now, this isn't a suggestion that's given to us if we're a follower of Jesus. It is a command that we're given in Scripture. And when we truly understand what this armor is and how it applies to our life, you'll discover that it is absolutely essential. Now, when the Apostle Paul, who's the, who's the human author of this letter, when he was writing it, he was imprisoned in Rome. And the way his imprisonment worked, according to, to the history and what we see in the scriptures is he was, for the most part, under house arrest because he was a Roman citizen. And what that meant was that every day um, throughout 
the day and throughout the night, he would be chained to a Roman soldier. So every day when he looked up, when he opened his eyes first thing in the morning, he saw the armor of a Roman soldier. He would have seen the boots, the breastplate, the, the belt, the helmet, the sword. All that he would have, it would have been like breathing. I mean, whenever he would wake up, whenever he would go to sleep, whenever he would sing, he would see those things. And so that visual representation was very close to him. But really what he's talking about is far deeper because this picture of the armor that's displayed here in the scripture is a picture of the armor of the Messiah. It is not necessarily the picture of the armor of a Roman soldier. It's not human armor. It is divine armor. In fact, every piece of armor in Ephesians 6 points to Jesus Christ. It points directly to who he is. So in truth, we do not put on our spiritual armor any more than David was able to to wear Saul's armor. He was armored, he was protected when he stood against Goliath by the armor of God, by his faith. And that is what fits perfectly for each and every one of us. We put on the armor of Jesus. That is what is described here. Now, in this message, in a, in a few moments, I'm going to make some very powerful I am statements, and I'll probably ask you to say them out loud as well. But I want you to understand this is not a message about us. Even though I'll say those truths, that's so that we can stand in the armor of Jesus. And so every time we say an I am statement, we're saying that it's true only because of who Jesus is and what he has done. It all points to him. And and that is the great freedom and the great joy that we can experience because we discover that we stand in his victory, in his strength, in his armor, and not our own. Um, Ian Duguid put it this way, and it's so powerful and true. We fight and stand firm against Satan only in the strength that comes from the victory that Christ has already won for us. The battle's already over, but we are to stand firm in the ground that God has already won for you and for me. So let's go and look at the the scriptural background and and see where this imagery that Paul is talking about in Ephesians 6, where it comes from and how it applies to Jesus. And then we're going to try to make it very practical for our own heart and life and see what it means. Well, first of all, what's mentioned is the belt of truth. And we looked at this significantly last week, so I won't take much time here. But the belt of truth is that of the Messiah King. And by the way, when I use the word Messiah, that comes from the Hebrew. It means the anointed one. If I use the word Christ, that comes from Greek. And guess what it means? It means the anointed one. It's the exact same title, okay? Messiah is simply Old Testament. Christ is simply New Testament language. It's just a different language. Exact same word, exact same meaning, and it all points to the person of Jesus Christ. He alone is Christ the Messiah, which was redundant if you understand what I just said. But that's okay. I say a lot of redundant things. Here's what it says, though, 